Those are the 12-minute segments, New Testaments. So there's 260 12-minute episodes because there's 260 chapters in the New Testament. So I finish Revelation 20, 21, 22 tomorrow, and, uh, and that'll be that. It's the second time we did it. We did it one time in the Passion Translation, and I wasn't satisfied with it, so we did it again in the NIV. I did. I liked the Passion Translation. I didn't like the, um, the teaching from it. The Passion Translation is a dynamic equivalent, so it's very wordy, um, like the Amplified. So in a 12-minute segment, it's mostly all you have time for with one chapter is reading that, you know, pretty much. There's not much time to talk about it. So um, do you all know the difference between a dynamic equivalent and a translation? So the Living Bible is another example of a dynamic equivalent. A dynamic equivalent, they try to get the meaning behind the text as opposed to a word-for-word -word, uh, equivalence. And um, it's very difficult to get a word-for-word -word equivalence because... Um, uh, both Greek and Hebrew are so expansive in their meanings. So the dynamic equivalent has, has merit, but it makes for a very thick, voluminous um, Bible. Lynn, you doing all right? Okay. Anybody need a Bible? Everybody got one? Good. Jeremiah, chapter 1. And uh, we'll pray and get started. You got it what you need, Josh? We're good? Okay, so Lord, we bless you. We thank you, God, for, um, for Jeremiah and this, um, this chance to study uh, the words that are penned in his name in our Bibles. Lord, um, uh, we appreciate all of your words, all of your scriptures, all of the books of the Bible. We ask you, Lord, for um, uh, clarity and revelation from the pages, God, that you would come and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, uh, if you've got those notes that I wrote for you, um, the traditional author is Jeremiah, but there are several places from within the text itself, uh, most notably chapter 36 in depth, uh, where Baruch is told to write down what Jeremiah said. In fact, when we get to chapter 36, which don't turn there now, um, it specifically records that 23 years of Jeremiah's words were written down by Baruch. And so um, if Baruch wrote down 23 years of the prophecies of Jeremiah, um, he might have written the entire or the bulk of this book under Jeremiah's names. Um, the words obviously came from the Lord to Jeremiah, but it was not unusual for uh, the Bible writers to use scribes. Paul did it himself. So um, uh, we'll get to Baruch in due season, but um, uh, Baruch was Jeremiah's companion. He was of a, a family that was kind of notable and um, not exactly a royal family, but he was someone of note in the culture. The time of the writing uh, is approximately 626 to 586 B.C. And um, we got a pretty good bookend on that because Jeremiah started writing before the Babylonian conquest began. And he continued to write until the Babylonian conquest ended. So we know it began in 606, 605 B.C. We know that Jerusalem fell in 586 B.C. So that's the time frame, roughly 40 years, that, um, that Jeremiah wrote. Um, he is a contemporary with both Daniel and Ezekiel. And so together they've been called the prophets of the captivity because they wrote during this time of uh, the Babylonians coming and destroying Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah, and um, uh, destroying Jerusalem itself and destroying the temple. So the, the three, three of the greatest prophets who ever lived were writing about the same events from three different perspectives. And so just like in this room, we have um, a table, set of tables over here to the left, a set of tables in the front, a set of tables here. All of you are looking this way from different directions. In the case of Daniel, Daniel was writing from the court of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Uh, Jeremiah was writing from within Jerusalem, the events that were unfolding. And Ezekiel is writing from among the captives in Babylon by, uh, in the refugee camp, if you will, um, by the, the uh, uh, rivers of Babylon. So they, um, they were writing in real time about the same events, but different perspectives. Daniel went with the first wave of captives 
It's believed that Ezekiel went with the second wave of captives and Jeremiah was in Jerusalem for the whole time during all this stuff. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a little cough tonight, so if I take a mint, y'all just have to forgive me. So the, um, the prophet Jeremiah, I want to just um, talk about him for a minute if I can. There's a number of characters in the Bible that um, their personalities are revealed in the course of their, their writings um, and the, the things that were written about them. Um, Samuel, first and second Samuel, reveals a lot about the personality of David, the personality of Samuel, the personality of Saul. But the personality of Jeremiah comes through in the writings. And uh, at times, Jeremiah is speaking for the Lord. At times, Jeremiah is speaking for himself in the text. And um, uh, he had a very, very difficult job. Remember, his ministry lasted 40 years, and nobody believed what he was saying. And then when it became obvious what he was saying was true, the Babylonians are coming, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, there was nothing... There was no victory in it for him. His very friends and family and co-workers that he was trying to warn who had not believed him were killed. And so it wasn't like he was vindicated and he was all happy, you know, and see, I told you so. He, um, uh, he had a very, very difficult prophetic min ministry with no victory parade at the end. And so if you look at um, Jeremiah's life, he never married, he never had kids. He was actually forbidden by the Lord to marry. I'll show you that text at some point in the, in the scriptures. Um, his life in the natural didn't make a lot of sense. He came to the Lord um, as the Lord's prophet as a fairly young man, probably in his early 20s. And um, as I said, prophesied nobody wanted to hear. There was a whole bunch of other people saying things different. They were basically saying the Lord's always delivered us. The Lord's going to deliver us again. And Jeremiah kept saying, not this time. Not this time, not this time, and they didn't want to hear it. And so, a um, uh, very thankless, thankless job. Um, if you look down at the bottom of the first page of those notes, there's a um, there's a, a, a notation on there that says this book gives us the Old Testament's clearest words concerning the New Covenant. And so, the New Covenant is actually prophesied specifically. Um, in Jeremiah 31, 31, and it's alluded to several other places, but just reading 31, 31 and following. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So this, this new covenant, um, at the time that this was written in, in uh, Jeremiah's day, the house of Israel had been destroyed and carried away into captivity. They'd been gone for over 120 years. But the Lord's prophesying he'll make a new covenant with them, even though they're the, the so-called lost tribes by this time. And uh, verse 32, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they, they broke, although I was a husband to them. Now note that I was a husband to them because the Lord in the prophetic scriptures over and over again refers to the Sinai covenant as a marriage covenant. He often refers to himself as the husband of Israel and Israel as his wife. And so uh, the Lord was a faithful husband. Israel was an unfaithful wife. And um, uh, we'll come back to that in some of the text tonight. Verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law in their inward part, and I'll write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Of course, the new covenant was initiated with the coming of Jesus Christ in the first century. But by and large, the Jewish people have not embraced the new covenant yet. So there's an already fulfillment. The new covenant has come. It's open to everybody, Jew and Gentile alike. But this promise of the Jews accepting it in mass has not happened yet. There's still an awakening coming for the Jewish people as foretold in the scriptures. Now, Jeremiah, um, we'll start in chapter 1. So if you just flip over to your, your notes page on chapter 1. Chapter 
Hi, we got a nurse in the house. We're in good shape. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anatoth in the land of Benjamin. And so if you, if you recall, when we were going through um, uh, Kings and Chronicles at the time of the divided kingdom, I told you that most of the Levites fled from the northern kingdom and moved down and interspersed with Benjamin and Judah. And so the Levites, remember the, um, uh, the, the wicked ruler Jeroboam had to set up false priests because the Levites had left. So he set up a false priesthood, um, idol worship and so forth. But the Levites, Jeremiah is a Levite. He was living among the tribe of Benjamin. So he identified with the tribe of Benjamin, although he was of, of a Levitic descent. Verse 2, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. So he gives the first um, king mentioned there. And, and we, we know the timing of his writing because the kings he wrote under. So in the days of King Josiah, in the 13th year of his reign, it also came in the days of jo Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, to the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah. And there was actually um, one more king, a puppet king, who lasted a, just a few months in that same period of time. Jehoiahaz ruled for 90 days um, in that same period of time before Jehoiakim. He was also a son of Josiah. To the, he reigned and um, prophesied until the 11th year of, of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, to the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. And so that's 626, the, the timing 13th year of Josiah to the carrying away captive of Zedekiah is 626 B.C. to 586 B.C. Okay, We know that from extra biblical sources when these things happen. Verse 4, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the belly or in the womb, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. I want to just pause on that verse 5, okay? So before I formed you, I knew you. What does that mean? Just take a shot. No wrong answer. He knew you in the beginning, so some kind of pre-existent knowledge of you before you were born in, into the earth. Yeah, that's a possibility. Um, what else? Before I formed you, I knew you. What? Yeah, yeah. He was chosen as a prophet before he was created as a human being. That's true. What else? He's... There was a plan for him. He says he ordained him. He appointed him as a prophet for the nations before he was even born. And so this idea of, you know, um, life in the womb, there was a full lifetime planned out for this man before his conception, much less from the point of conception, you know. Um, but there's this verse 5 also, theologically, is this the foreknowledge of God or did he actually have a relationship with Jeremiah before he was born? You see the question. And so some of the, some of the cults claim that there was a pre-existing um, state before we came here, and um, uh, this is what it's alluding to, this and other verses. Mormonism, for example, thinks there's a soul state prior to coming here that um, you you got selected. You know, you, you win the lottery, you get to go, however it worked. So we, our assumption is, my assumption is, before I formed you, I knew you. This is the foreknowledge of God, the plan that he had for Jeremiah. It's not that there was this big quiz show in heaven, you know, and, and uh, he was selected. But it's the foreknowledge of God. Verse 6, Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I can't speak, for I'm just a child. That's actually a youth. And uh, if you go through the different um, pedigrees of Jeremiah and his family and all that. He was in his early 20s. He was probably 20 to 24 years old. So he's not a 10-year-old. He's a young man. He's a, he's a youth. And so normally, a Levitical priest would not start to prophesy or would not start to minister in the temple until they're 30 years old. So in that respect, he's underage, you know, but he's not a kid. 
In verse 7, but the Lord said to me, don't say I'm a child or a youth, for you shall go to all that I'll send you to, and whatsoever I command you, you will speak. Don't be afraid of their faces, for I'm with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand, and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I put my words in your mouth. What does this say about, um, what does this sound like compared to the call of Isaiah? Does anybody remember the call of Isaiah in chapter 6? What happened? Yeah, the angel of the Lord took the coal from off the altar and touched Isaiah's mouth. Here the Lord himself touches Jeremiah's mouth. I think I'll take the Lord himself as opposed to the angel of the Lord. And I don't like the hot coal on the mouth thing either. That doesn't sound too good. By the way, I bet it hurt. You know, I don't think it was uh, the hot coal on the lips. I don't know what that felt like. Verse 10, see, I've set you this day over nations and over kingdoms. Now look at, look at specifically what his call is. To root out and to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. Now this nations is plural, kingdoms is plural. Um, nations and kingdoms, not over a nation and over a kingdom. And it's not just to destroy, pull down, root out, pull down, destroy, but also to build and to plant. And so it's a little bit hard to find where Jeremiah built in the text. And uh, we'll talk about that some more as we go forward because there's a whole lot of extra biblical stuff around Jeremiah that we'll talk about in the, in the days ahead. Verse 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And he said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And so this branch of an almond tree, does anybody have any idea why he would say, I see an, an almond tree? This is, he's having some type of vision with an almond tree. So almond tree in that time and place, almonds are the, the first tree that buds. It buds in January and February, months before the other trees do. So it's like the first tree to blossom and, bl and, and um, uh, bud. And so he's seeing like the first expression of the, of the harvest way before it happens. And the Lord says to him, um, you've seen well, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Just like this, this thing has arrived here early with the blossoming of the tree. And so um, he's, he goes on to talk about the, the um, commissioning that he's given him in verse 17. He says, therefore, gird up your loins and arise, and I will speak unto them uh, all so that I may command you. And be not dismayed at their faces lest I, I confound you or put you to shame before them. It's interesting, he says, don't be dismayed at their faces several times in this chapter. Does anybody remember Saul's explanation to Samuel, you know, as to why he didn't wait on Samuel to come? He said, I looked at the people's faces and I felt like I had to do something, basically. And so the Lord is one, warning Jeremiah, don't be moved by the impact on the people. You'd be moved by my word and what I command you to speak. By the way, it says, gird up your loins. Does everybody know where loins are? <laughs> it's your waist. It's your waist. So this is a, a, a loin, uh, around your loins is where your belt goes. I used to think it was somewhere else, but it's not. Verse 18, for behold, I have made you this day a defense city and an iron pillar and um, brazen walls or bronze walls against the whole land against the kings of judah against the princes thereof the priests thereof and against the people of the land they shall fight against you but they shall not prevail against you for i'm with you says the lord to deliver you now my misconceptions when i when i used to meditate on this i somehow i thought the lord was saying I'm going to make you immune to any response from the people. Doesn't it sound like that? Because he says, don't respond to the people. Then he says, I'm going to make you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall. It sounds like he's saying to Jeremiah, you're going to deliver my word, and it's not going to affect you. Whatever they say against you is not going to affect you. That's the way I read it. In point of fact, these people ripped his heart out, his whole ministry. He's known as the weeping prophet for a reason. He was grieved horrifically over the rejection that he suffered throughout his ministry. And so rather than make him um, 
immune to the criticism of the people, the Lord actually gave him a very tender heart to prophesy to these people, all the while while they're ripping his heart out. And it's, it's very different than the way I would have done it if I were in charge of this situation, but I'm not in charge. And that's the way the Lord does you and me, by the way. He doesn't make you immune to hurt. He makes you have a soft heart to, toward the very people who can hurt you. And then you have to forgive them and soften your heart again and be willing to hurt, be hurt again and again and again. Jeremiah did this for over 40 years continually. And his whole nation was against him. Chapter 2. And so the Lord begins to lay out his um, case for what's going on to Jeremiah. In verse 1, he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your espousal, the King James says in verse 2, or your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Remember once again, the Lord views himself as the husband from the time of Mount Sinai. He led him out of Egypt into a marriage covenant at Mount Sinai between Exodus chapter 19 and 24. And so his, his approach to all this has always been one of love. I love you. You know, I want you to be my people. It's going to be like a good marriage. You know, we are um, committed to one another. So he's saying to Israel, I led you out. I, I did my part. I loved you. We were engaged. We were betrothed. And um, uh, verse 3, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. And all that shall devour him shall offend. Uh, evil shall come on them, says the Lord. In other words, he was their protector and, and, and so forth. In verse 5, Thus says the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and walked after vanity, and have become uh, vain? And so this, um, uh, they followed, they've left him for idols. They've fallen into idolatry. And uh, it's always interesting to me that the Lord calls idolatry adultery. You know, that goes back to this whole idea of being married to his people. And so to him, worship of another God is marital infidelity. That's why it's spiritual adultery. Verse 11, has a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which is, uh, doesn't profit to idols. And um, so the judgment, verse, um, uh, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewed out the, for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is referring to the idols. So they've rejected the one true God who, um, who loved them, and they've created false gods. And so the, uh, the judgment of heaven is coming on them. Verse um, Still in chapter 2, verse 27, the people have said to um, uh, a tree, you are my father, and to a stone you have brought me forth, for they have turned their back on me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. But where are your gods that you've made or that have made you? Let them arise and see if they can save you in the time of trouble. For according to the number of your cities are your gods, O Judah. In other words, every city had its own idols. That's what the... Um, uh, the accusation from the Lord is. And so the Lord mocks these um, false gods, especially in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and uh, to a lesser degree, Daniel. Um, verse 29, Wherefore, why do you plead with me? You've all transgressed against me, says the Lord. In vain have I smitten your children or corrected your children. They received no correction. Your own sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. And then um, uh, it goes on back to the, the bridal idea, verse 32. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. And so the Lord, if, um, if I can say this without sounding disrespectful to God, honestly, this comes across like they hurt his feelings. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, he's got... We get our feelings from somewhere. We're created in the image of God. And I know he's the Almighty, and we're not going to destroy him or anything, but he's hurt over this thing. I mean, he, it's not like it's sterile to him either. 
is very painful. And the language that he uses is, is language like a husband who's been cheated on. You know, his feelings are hurt. Uh, verse chapter 3, uh, verse 1. So God was the faithful husband and Israel was the unfaithful wife. Chapter 3, verse 1. They say if a man puts away his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, shall he return to her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But you've played the harlot with many lovers, yet you return to me, uh, says the Lord. And in your notes under chapter 3, I put that same two verses in uh, the NIV. It says, if a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, should he return to her again? Would not the land be completely defiled? But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers. And would you now return to me, declares the Lord. So this is um, the spiritual adultery, once again, um, is being alluded to. In verse um, uh, 6, the Lord said to me, In the days of Josiah the king, have you not seen that which backsliding Israel has done? She's gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. He's talking about worshiping false gods, but it's like the, his wife went off and had an affair in the woods with some guy. You know, that's the way the Lord's imagery is. Verse 7, And I said, After she had done all these things, turn back to me. But she returned not. And I saw her treacherous sister, um, Judah, also saw it. So first he's talking about Israel, and then he's talking about um, Judah as the sister. That imagery of Israel and Judah being sisters plays out in Ezekiel, too. Ezekiel 23 is um, one of the most unusual chapters in the Bible. And it compares the two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, as to two blatantly sexually adulterous women, sisters. Verse 8, And I saw when for all of the causes, therefore backsliding Israel, committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So he's saying Judah didn't learn anything from the Assyrian destruction of the northern kingdom for their sins of idolatry. Verse 9, it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with wood. And yet for all of this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but um, pretendedly, says the Lord. In other words, they've, they've um, uh, acted like they were doing something different, but they weren't. Now look at your, um, uh, again in your notes, that same Jeremiah 3, 8 in the NIV, the, the wording is a little less vague. I gave faithful Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. He's talking about the captivity, the northern destruction of the northern kingdom. Yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. Because Israel's immorality mattered so little to her, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stone and wood. And that's talking about idols. In spite of all this, her unfaithful sister Judah did not return to me with all of her heart, but only in pretense, declares the Lord. The Lord said to me, Faith, faithless Israel is more righteous than unfaithful Judah. And he's already destroyed Israel in the Assyrian conquest, 722 B.C. Now he's about to destroy Judah, and he's saying, you guys deserve it more than they did. This is what his prophet is, is hearing. And so, um, uh, Ed, you guys are, are here, normally you're watching on the internet, okay? So when I'm going through this stuff, um, you sitting there with your Bible, or what are, you, what are you doing? You got the notes? How do you do this at home? You don't have any notes? So Peter posts the notes so you can download them, so you don't ever have the notes. You download, the, so you watch online too. You download the notes electronically, or you print them? Just curious. The Genesis ones are deleted? Really? We got to go back and get them because the Genesis ones are, um, uh, are substantive. 
I've, I can give you the Genesis notes. I've got all the notes. Yeah, I'll talk to Peter about that. Remind me, uh, Josh, because we're right now, Peter is going back and the archived ones, a lot of them just say Bible study. It doesn't have the, the well, he's changing all those and putting the chapters covered and we'll make sure the notes are accessible too. By the way, if I put all these notes together, I think I'd have about five or 600 pages. <laughs> it's most of it's Bible verses, just copied stuff, huh? Well, it's, it's my reminders. It's my reminders. Oh, good. I'm glad. See, I'm getting my feedback. I'm just having to, I'm having to extort it. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, verse 14, still in chapter 3. The Lord's saying, turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I'm married to you. There's that declaration again. Judah, I'm committed to you. Repent. And I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I'll bring you to Zion, and I will give you shepherds according to my heart, which will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days. Now he's talking about some future period of time. Hi, Yushik. Says the Lord, and y'all, tonight I have to give an altar call to make sure that he gets a chance to get saved, just in case. Sorry. <laughs> he's, he's saved. This is alluding now. The prophet jumps from the immediate circumstance of Judah's in trouble with Babylon to the future restoration of Israel. So again, verse 16. It shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done anymore. Now, has that happened yet? Are people still looking for the ark of the covenant? They are. They're still looking for the ark of the covenant. And so this, this speaks of a time that hasn't happened yet. By the way, the Ark of the Covenant still exists. The real one still exists in heaven. I'll show you in Revelation where it appears. But um, as far as it went on the earth, I don't know whether it exists or not. It's not relevant. The Lord is not bound to the Ark of the Covenant. It's not a magic box. You know, it's just a, a, a symbol from antiquity. It has no um, power indwelling in it, it of itself. The only power related to the Ark of the Covenant was the God of the Ark who was present in in uh, conjunction with it, but it's stuck somewhere. The Lord is not stuck wherever the box is, deteriorated in the ground. He's not relegated to that box. Um, thank God, he's here. <laughs> Verse uh, 17, at that time, another key prophetic word, in those days, at that time, this is a, uh, pay attention prophetically, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. And this is alluding once again to the, prophetically, to the new covenant, you know, to the end of days when Israel, um, the house of Israel will walk in these things. Verse 18, in those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. Now this speaks of a restoration that has not yet happened. Israel, the ten northern tribes were uh, dispersed on or about 722 B.C., and they'd never been reassembled again. So they dripped and drabbed back to the Middle East. They were spread all over the planet. But this talks about the house of Judah and the house of Israel being identified again. Those, those excuse me, northern ten tribes being identified. They shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I've given to them for an inheritance uh, to your fathers. And so the land of the north, some have alluded to the fall of the Soviet Union where more than a million Jewish people left the former Soviet Union to make Aliyah to um, Israel. That may have been a fulfillment of this or may have been a, a partial fulfillment or maybe not. But a bunch of people did come from the north to go to Israel. Verse 20, Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. So this um, uh, bridal motif again with God, the husband, and Israel, the wife. 
um, appears over and over and over again. And then um, uh, the Lord calls them to repentance and um, in part, Jeremiah speaks words of repentance. Verse 24, for shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our confusion covers us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even to this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Now, Jeremiah, notice the pronouns he uses, we, just like Daniel. Uh, Jeremiah doesn't say they have sinned against the Lord our God. He says we have sinned against the Lord our God. He identifies with his people, just like Daniel will do later, this vicarious repentance and um, identifying with them in, in the sin. Um, does everybody know what vicarious repentance is? Does anybody here not know that term? Vicarious repentance. You don't know that term. And nobody else is willing to say they don't know the term. Or everybody, you don't know the term. It means to repent for somebody else. To, to vi vicarious, to repent uh, vicariously. You repent for someone else's sin as if it were your own. You take the position of identifying with them as we rather than they. And so that's, um, that's true intercession. Like Moses interceded for the children of Israel, kept God from destroying them on two different major occasions, and um, appears various places in the scriptures where someone will stand in the gap. And uh, at other times, as you know, the Lord looked for someone to take that position of intercession and couldn't find anyone. Chapter 4, uh, the Lord is bringing his judgments. Um, in verse 1, if you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me, and if not, or if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be um, shaken or moved. And you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in justice, in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, in him shall they glory. So there's, um, there's still time here um, for repentance. There's this... Um, doom that Jeremiah is prophesying at this point is not irreversible. In verse 14, O Jerusalem, wash the heart, your heart from wickedness so that you may be saved. How long will your vain thoughts lodge within you? And um, uh, there's evil coming, but even yet there's still time for repentance. And I want to I interject something into the text. And um, uh, from this point forward, there's... Um, Jeremiah is not written in chronological order. Um, sometimes Jeremiah alludes to the kings that were in place and what year of the king's reign the prophetic words came. But the bulk of this prophecy of Jeremiah is a compilation. So I want you to hold your finger. We're going to come back to chapter 5. Flip over to chapter 36 real briefly. There's 54 chapters total in Jeremiah. But in chapter 36, we get instructions. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. But it says, um, the Lord tells Jeremiah to take a scroll. And uh, in verse 2, he says, Write all the words I've spoken to you against Israel and Judah from the days of Josiah. That's when uh, he started. Remember, he started in the 13th year of Josiah. Um, even to this day. And the, um, uh, the day that's that's being talked about there is the fourth year of Jehoiakim. This is a 23 year period that's alluded to here. So these things are compiled. 23 years of Jeremiah's words are compiled under the direction of the Lord in chapter 36. And the guy that writes them down is this Baruch. And so there's, um, there's no, if you try to do Jeremiah chronologically, it won't work. But if you, if you notice in Jeremiah, at certain times, it's not too late for them to repent. At other times, it is too late for them to repent. A lot of that has to do with when the words were given, you know, because they're not positioned in the scriptures the way that they were laid down. Whatever they were done, uh, the reason they were done this way is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You can ask him when you get there. But it's not laid out sequentially um, as perhaps, you know, you would have done it. So, 
chapter 5, the Lord is looking for um, righteous people. In verse 1, he says, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, if there be any that executes judgment or justice, that seeks the truth, and I'll pardon it. So that verse 1 of chapter 5, that says, if I can find one righteous person, I'll spare Jerusalem. That's, um, uh, that's a pretty tall order. But he says in the NIV, it's worded this way, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, look around and consider, search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I'll forgive this city. Now remember the case of Abraham and Sodom and Gomorrah? God was visiting Abraham and he was telling uh, Abraham, I got to go down and check on that wicked city down there. And Abraham says, Lord, you know, won't you have mercy on that city if there's 50 righteous people there? And the Lord says, yeah, if there's 50 righteous people there, I'll spare the city. And then Abraham says, Lord, if there's only 40, will you spare the city? And the Lord says, yeah, if there's only 40. He goes on until he gets down to 10. And he says, Lord, if there's only 10, will you spare the city? He says, yep, if there's only 10, I'll spare the city. And so, as you know, he goes there, and the only one they find that's righteous is Lot. And um, in that case, he took Lot out of the place and destroyed the city. Here, in chapter 5, verse 1, he tells Jeremiah to go find one righteous person in Jerusalem, and he'll spare the city. And is that hyperbole, or is that a real offer? I don't know. Any opinions? You're a seminarian. What do you think? You think it's the Lord trying to make a point, or you think he was actually extending an offer? So this, this idea of ten righteous um, with Abraham and Sodom became a template in Judaism. And so the, uh, the template being you can't have a religious service in Judaism without 10 men, 10 righteous men theoretically, but 10 men. And so they, it's called a minion. You have to have a minimum of 10. And there are other places in the scriptures where they gathered uh, 10. They had to have at least 10. But in this instance, it looks like the Lord says he, he so wanted to spare Jerusalem that he wasn't going to hold out for the 10. You know, does it take 10 for Washington, D.C.? I don't know. Does it take 10 for Oakton? I don't know. Does it take one? Does it take 1,000? I'm not sure what the, what the metric is, whether 10 is the, the number every time or not. But uh, the Lord is able to spare those that are his, as in the case of Lot, whether he spares the city or not. In verse 2, And though they say the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not your eyes upon the truth? You have stricken them but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They've made their faces harder than a rock. They've refused to return. So Jeremiah is interacting with God in the midst of the, uh, the prophetic exchange. Verse 4, Therefore I said, Surely these are poor, they're foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgments of their God. Um, the Lord speaking, verse 7, how shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by the troops in the harlot's houses. And so this um, uh, harlot's houses in this case is not literal prostitution, but spiritual prostitution. Um, verse 12, they have lied about the Lord and said, it is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword or famine. Remember, this is what Jeremiah faced his whole ministry. They kept saying, it's not true. We're not going to face judgment. Verse 13, and the prophets shall become wind, and the word is not in them. Thus it shall be done to them. Wherefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth like fire. And this people would, and it shall devour them. I want to just pause for a second. When Jeremiah was writing, when Isaiah was writing, when Ezekiel was writing, when Daniel was writing, when all of the minor prophets were writing, literally this word 
was in their mouths. The word of God, the word of God coming from them was what would become the written word of God. There is no prophetic voice on the planet today on par with that. Do you understand what I'm saying? They were, they were giving expression literally to the word of God as it became written. And so their words, um, uh, are there, does the Lord use men and women to speak for him? He does to this day. But this is different. The kind of words that were coming forth, the revelatory words that would last for all of time and eternity were being delivered through these, uh, these vessels uniquely. Verse 15, I'll bring a nation upon you from afar, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It's an ancient nation, a nation whose language you don't know. Neither do you understand what they say. And this goes on to talk about the coming of the Babylonians in chapter 5. Um, one more word on the, on the faults in verse, um, uh, verse 30. It says, An astonishing and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests uh, bear rule by their own power. It says their means in King James, by their own power. And my people love to have it this way. And what will you do in the end thereof? In other words, the people like it that way. They like it when the priests don't minister the word of the Lord. They like it when the priests operate in their own authority. The people have accepted it. That's the way they like it. They tell the people what they want to hear. That's what they're there for. But it doesn't do them any good. This idea of the word like fire, too, we'll come back to that in Jeremiah 23. The Lord's word in this mouth like fire. The image, though, my word is like fire in your mouth, and the people are the wood, and it shall devour them. The word of the Lord shall devour the people. That's, uh, that's not the way we want to be combustible. Do you have a lot of teenagers show up? Good start. Chapter 6. Remember Jeremiah was living among the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Levite, but here in chapter 6 he warns Benjamin. O oh, you children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa. And set up a sign of fire in Beth Hakarim, for evil appears out of the north in great destruction. This is again talking about the coming of the Babylonians. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So he's speaking kindly towards, um, uh, towards Israel still. Uh, verse 6 For thus has the Lord of hosts said, Hew down trees and cast a siege mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. It is holy um, oppression in the midst of her. So he's, he's uh, decreeing the siege of Jerusalem and telling Benjamin to free, flee in advance of the coming siege. Verse 9, thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back your hand as a, great, a grape gatherer into its baskets. And um, uh, the... Uh, destruction is, is coming. In verse 13, for from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given over to covetousness. From the prophet to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed also the hurt of my daughter, um, of my people, slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So they've given, they've given false assurance, made them feel better, but they're not... Um, not any better off. By the way, that peace, peace is shalom, shalom. Verse 16, thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we'll not walk therein. So it gives, a, it gives very specific instructions. Stand in the ways of the Lord and see and ask for the old paths the way that the Lord had told you to live and to remain. And uh, where is the good path? Walk in the good path, that's the ways of the Lord, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we're not going to walk in the ways of the Lord. And so um, evil has been decreed. Uh, verse 19, Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they've not listened to my words nor to my law, but they've rejected it. 
And so um, this, this cycle of the Lord extending mercy and them refusing it over and over again. How many of you would like to have a ministry like Jeremiah's? Anybody here want to volunteer for it? I don't think I want that ministry. All right, so it gets worse for Jeremiah, in my opinion, in chapter 7. In chapter 7, the Lord says, go to the temple of Solomon and stand there and prophesy this stuff. Now, everybody that just, let me just set the stage. We're in a church right now, right? So in our, in our thinking, everybody here is a Christian. Everybody here is seeking God. In the temple of Solomon, your assumption would be they're there seeking the God of Israel, right? And so here's the Lord's prophet standing in the door of the temple where all the religious people are coming to worship God, and he's giving them a fit. <laughs> so verse 1, the word came to uh, Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Go stand in the gate of the Lord's house. That's the temple. And proclaim there this word. Say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah, all you that enter in the gates to worship the Lord. This is like some guy standing in front of his church on Sunday morning. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Don't trust in lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, you keep saying, we're going to the temple. Great. The Lord says, it's not doing you any good. You know. Um, verse 8, behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. When you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods who you know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. And then the Lord asks a question, verse 11, is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, says the Lord. Who else would talk about the house of the Lord being a den of robbers? Yeah, so his prophet is, is speaking. It's a little foreshadowing of a messianic prophecy that Jesus himself would, um, would make in referencing the money chamber changers. So the, the, uh, you want to go to the temple. You want to worship God. And you got this crazy guy standing there saying, you're all in trouble. You're coming in here. The Lord's not listening to you. You know, he doesn't like what you have to say. That's not the way to become you know, to have the top television Christian show on, on network, is it? It's not exactly a seeker-friendly message. Now, the, Lord, it, the Lord's interacting with Jeremiah. Jeremiah's interacting with the people. Jeremiah's interacting with the Lord. The Lord is interacting directly with Jeremiah. He gives him some very strange instructions. And this one instruction I'm about to point out, he gives several times. The first time, verse 16, Therefore, don't pray for these people, neither lift up nor cry in prayer for them. Don't make intercession to me, for I'm not going to listen to you, Jeremiah. He specifically tells Jeremiah not to pray for his own people. Now, if this was the only time, I would think that was just a, a, an anomaly. But he actually tells him several different times. Has anybody here ever had the Lord tell them not to pray for somebody? I have never had that. I've never had anything like that. But it's very clear the Lord had had it. It was, it was to the point where he was not allowing Jeremiah to intercede on their behalf. It had gone too far. Has anybody here ever experienced anything like that? You have? How so? That's a good example. That's a good example. Yeah. No, you can't ask God to approve of what he's already disapproved of. That's a good, good, good uh, example. But this, imagine how this hurt him. He was wanting to stand between God and these people. And the Lord told him, don't do it. You know, you don't, you're not going to take that position of authority with me. Remember, we talked about vicarious repentance before. Here he's forbidding it. Um, verse 20, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place. 
upon man and upon beasts, upon the trees of the field, upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and not be quenched. That's pretty definitive, isn't it? Um, verse 21, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not to your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. In other words, the, to obey is better than sacrifice. That's what he's saying here. They're still going to the temple on the feast and the festivals and the Sabbath. They're still lighting the incense. They're still sacrificing the, the lambs. And he says, you're missing the whole point. You're missing the whole point. This thing I commanded them saying, obey my voice and I'll be your God. You shall be my people and walk in all my ways that I've commanded you so that it may be well with you. But they hearkened not nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imaginations of their evil heart and went backwards. They backslid and not forward. And then Jeremiah is told um, a lot of unusual things in the book. He has a number of prophetic acts. And occasionally in the text of Jeremiah, the Lord personifies something inanimate. And so in verse 29, he personifies Jerusalem. He makes Jerusalem have a human uh, aspect. He says to Jerusalem, cut off your hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away. Now, Jerusalem doesn't have any hair. So this is a prophetic implication. Cut off your hair, O Jerusalem, cast it away. Take up a lamentation on the high places. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. So lamentation is a funeral dirge. Cutting off your hair is a, a sign of extreme mourning. You know, to cut your hair or to rip your hair out is like extreme grief. And so that's what, um, what the Lord is calling for. Verse 30, For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to pollute it. They built the high places of Tephet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. This reference to the Hinnom Valley and the burning of the sons and the daughters is Molech worship. Uh, the, the procedure was to heat the idol, the um, iron or bronze Molech idol to um, like burning um, temperature and put a live baby on the molten arms like this and burn them to death. Those, you can find those idols today in Israel in the Jerusalem Museum from the Hinnom Valley. Hinnom Valley is right beside Jerusalem. I think, you ask, you ask if I think there's a lot of supernatural stuff. I think there was an absence of supernatural stuff. And they were looking for something. I think they were distant from the Lord. And they were, they were searching. But, you know, was there demonic signs and wonders? I don't think so, but I don't know. Well, think of our culture. You know, there's not a lot of demonic signs and wonders. But the majority of people are looking into new age or into false things looking for something there are but it's not you know it's not you you said this is a bunch of them like shows in the streets i don't think so yeah It's an interesting question. I don't know. I know this, that the worship of these um, entities, um, there are spirits behind this stuff. You know, the idols are nothing. But there's some type of uh, spiritual power inflaming all this desire. And, you know, it's not natural to burn your children alive. That's not a natural thing to do. There's some type of demonic entity inspiring this behavior. So whether there was, you know, overt, you know, miracle type things or not, I don't know. But just the behavior being as aberrant as it was, there was a demonic component for sure. I've read that um, at various times in 
history. Uh, for example, during the times of the Puritans, supposedly demons used to manifest in the United States visibly, frequently. You know, it was a season where these things were happening. I don't know. I wasn't there, but supposedly. Okay. Um, so we're, we're moving now to... Um, uh, I'm still in chapter 7, but look at verse 33. Still talking about the destruction. And the carcasses of this people shall be meat or food for the fowls of heaven and for the beast of the earth, and none uh, shall fray them away or shall frighten them away. And then verse 34. Take note of verse 34, because this verse is a, a very important uh, foundational verse in Judaism. Uh, it's repeated various ways, and I'll, I'll explain. So, it, then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah a certain thing. And from the streets of Jerusalem, what's he going to cause to cease? The voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. Those four things, those um, voices, the voice of um, it worded in the NIV, voice of joy and, and gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, and the, the uh, jubilant voice of the bridegrooms. So these, these um, voices, has everybody seen a Jewish wedding with a, a hoopah? You know what a hoopah is? That's that tent thing they stand under when they get married. The, the cloth deal like an awning. That has four corners on it. And on the four corners are these four voices. And it speaks of uh, the renewal of Jerusalem and Israel. And so the prophetic scriptures are talk about the voices are going to cease and then their prophecies are going to come that the voices will be restored. And so in the marriage hoopas, they look forward to each marriage um, represents a time where these voices having to do with marriage will be restored once again. And so the, um, uh, if you ever look on the, the Hebrew in the corners, that's what they represent. This verse, this verse 34. The voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride. And so for a while it'll be desolate. And um, in 1948, they started using them again in Israel publicly for weddings. And they're still using them to this day. Those hoopas with the scriptures. Chapter 8, the people are still backslidden. Uh, verse 4, moreover, shall you say to them, thus says the Lord, Shall they fall and not rise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. And um, uh, the Lord is exhorting them to turn back, but they're not turning back. Uh, he, he actually makes an interesting analogy in verse 7. He basically says, birds know how to respond, but my people don't know how to respond to the Lord. Even a, a stupid bird knows how to respond in, in its right times, but my people don't know how to respond. Verse 9, the wise men are ashamed, they're dismayed and taken. They've rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them? Therefore will I give their wives to others, and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For everyone from the least even to the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. That's a pretty broad brush, but um, apparently, as I said, he couldn't even find one righteous person. Um, Jeremiah, back to his own expression of pain in the midst of this, in verse 18, when I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint within me. Behold, the voice of the cry of the daughters of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country, is not the Lord in Zion. Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am black, I am asto astonishment has taken hold on me. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? And so this lamentation. Uh, continues in chapter 9, verse 1. Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Now think of that imagery. This is not a guy who's happy with his lot in life. He's not happy about the prophecies delivering. 
He's not happy about the response of the people. Um, it's a very, very thankless, difficult ministry he's been called to. Thank God I don't have that particular ministry. But what a, what a very difficult thing. We're going to go through a lot of this in Jeremiah. But let me, let me point something out that just for all of us. These events um, unfolded roughly 2,600 years ago. In the 40 or so years that he was going through it, Jeremiah had one of the most difficult lives on the planet. Maybe one of the most difficult lives anybody ever had on this planet. But for the balance of those 2,600 years, he's been totally vindicated and um, been with the Lord he was the spokesman for. And although it was extremely painful, difficult, and arduous in the days of his flesh, he's been victorious, and he'll be victorious forever. So the 40 years, they were like that in the terms of just the 2,600. Imagine in, this, in the context of forever, you know, how long that is. So at the time it was going down, I'm sure it felt like it would never end. Looking back on it, for him, it's probably like a dream almost, these things that happen. So what's the moral of that story? Be faithful to what the Lord calls you to do, whether it's easy or difficult. But this, this verse 1 of chapter 9, he's referred to as the weeping prophet. He's not referred to as the hard-headed prophet or the heartless prophet. He's referred to as the weeping prophet. This was a man of sorrows and um, uh, a man who knew how to grieve deeply. So these words, I, I, you know, I don't know, um, uh, they're not my words, but it's very poetic. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears so that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. What a difficult poetic expression. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men that I might leave my people and go from them for they be all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. And they bend their tongues like a bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, says the Lord. Tough. Verse 9, Shall I not visit them for these things, says the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Verse 11, I'll make Jerusalem heaps or a, a heap of ruins and a den of jackals. I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Verse 13, the Lord says, Behold, they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and they've not obeyed my voice, neither have they walked therein. But they walked after the imagination of their own heart, after the Baalim, which their fathers taught them. Therefore, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, give them water of gall to drink. <coughs> I'll scatter them among the heathen who haven't known them or their fathers. Verse 19, For a voice of wailing is heard in Zion. How are we spoiled? We are greatly confounded because we have forsaken the land, because our dwellings have cast us out. And this is a prophetic foreshadowing about what's about to happen. In the midst of all this tough rhetoric and um, pain for both the Lord and his prophet and the people, there's a, there's a word of hope in verse 23 and 24 of this chapter 9. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the wise, mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. That loving kindness is, a, um, is the, the Hebrew word hesed, which is um, grace, love, faithfulness, covenant faithfulness, a loving kindness. It's translated as mercy. It's all of the above. It's not one of those things at a time. It's all of them at the same time. 
So the Lord exercises all of those things along with justice and righteousness. That's what he takes delight in. So that's the, that's the God he would have us to know. By the way, how we know the Lord and how we relate to the Lord has a lot to do with how he relates to us. I'm not going to develop that except to say, you know the parable of the talents where the one guy said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, so I hid my talent in the ground. And the Lord says, oh, you knew that about me, did you? And then he dealt with him very harshly. And there's a, there's a continuing thread through scripture. You know, to the froward, he will show himself froward. You know, to the, to the devious, he will show himself to be devious. The way that you respond to the Lord draws a similar response. So, my God is kind. My God is loving. My God is merciful. My God is full of hesed, this covenant faithfulness. That's the way he reveals himself. Remember, Moses was so shocked when the Lord says, The Lord, the Lord, full of kindness and mercy and grace. Moses was expecting something far different than that. The Lord says, No, this is the way I want you to think of me. This is the way I want you to relate to me. So we need to be very careful how we frame who it is we're relating to. You know. Chapter 10. Hear the word of, uh, which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, don't learn the ways of the heathen or the nations. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Verse 3, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cuts a tree out of the forest, works the hands of the workman with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails and with hammers so that it doesn't move. Now, what does this sound like? They cut a tree according to their customs out of the woods, and they decorate it and put it in their house. Does it ring a bell for anybody? Sounds like Christmas tree. <laughs> it does. <laughs> the tradition of the Christmas tree is not a Christian tradition. I know that people have a Christian slant on it. But the Christmas trees, I don't know anybody that worships their Christmas tree. In antiquity, they made idols out of trees. And they decorated them and stuck them in their houses. And so the tradition is from a pagan tradition. The difference being, I don't know any Christians that worship their Christmas tree. <laughs> You look perplexed. <laughs> not, not you, her. <laughs> her, you. So, um, don't learn the ways of the nations, the Lord is saying. So the, um, the Christmas tree thing, I don't have a religious prohibition against it. But this could allude to something like that. Cutting a tree, making an idol out of it, decorating it. Remember, their gods were made out of wood and stone. This was just another example of a wooden god. Um, Jeremiah prays again, verse 23. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Pour out your fury upon the heathen that know you not, and upon the families that call not on your name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him, consumed him, and made his habitation desolate. That's an interesting prayer, isn't it? The Lord's prophet in the midst of the, all the mess that was taking place. Um, in chapter 11... Once again, we're dealing with the broken covenant and the reasons for judgment. And once again, the Lord tells Jeremiah not to pray. In verse 1, the word of the Lord came um, to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Listen to the words of this covenant. Speak to the men of Judah. Verse 3, say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeys not the words of this covenant. Verse 4, which I commanded your fathers in that day, which I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you, so you shall be my people and I'll be your God. He's talking about the Sinai covenant, that they haven't upheld the, the uh, Mosaic covenant from Sinai. Um, verse 6, then the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah 
in the streets of Jerusalem saying, hear the words of this covenant and do them. So let me step aside from the text. Remember the Jeremiah, where the Lord comes, you're Jeremiah. Go stand in the temple at the entrance to the temple and prophesy over them. Okay. Jeremiah goes, stands in the temple, you know, you're sinners, all of your sinners, you're liars, you're adulterers. Isn't that what he said? Now he goes, that's not enough. Go to every street, every town and prophesy this stuff. So Jeremiah, you're not just going to sit in your house and say these words and nobody hears them. You're going to be a street preacher. So what are you preaching, Jeremiah? Are you preaching nice things? You know, again, verse six, the Lord said to me, proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, hear the words of this covenant and do them. Verse 11, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry to me, I'll not listen to them. Then shall the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry to the gods to who they offer incense, but they will not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of the cities were your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense to Baal, Therefore, don't pray for them. Verse 14. There it is again. Jeremiah, because of all this stuff, you can rebuke them, but don't pray for them. You can tell them why I'm mad, but don't pray for them. Therefore, pray not for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry to me for their trouble. And so, let's just set Jeremiah aside from the text. Over and over and over again in the Bible, we're told to call on the Lord when he's willing to hear. The implication is there's some time when he's not willing to hear anymore, right? And so these people have passed some kind of threshold with God. He doesn't want to hear, he doesn't even want to hear I surrender. He don't want to hear from him, period. It's like it's too late. It's already been decreed. It's, it's a done deal. And so this um, uh, receptivity from heaven is very important. It's important when the Lord is, uh, has given what the scriptures refer to as an open heaven, where heaven is accessible to, to take advantage of it, not to ignore uh, the accessibility to the Lord. But don't, we're, we're encouraged over and over again not to take the Lord's kindness for granted, nor to assume um, that he'll always be manifesting his presence and his accessibility, because he won't. Um, that's enough I, I'm not going to belabor that chapter 12 and let's just finish with chapter 12 more on the Lord's pending judgment righteous are you O Lord when I plead with you yet let me talk with you of your judgments wherefore do the ways of the wicked prosper why are they all happy that deal very treacherously this is Jeremiah asking the Lord um, uh, what he's observing with his eyes. Verse 3, But you, Lord, you know me, you've seen me, and tried my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter, and prepare them for the day of slaughter. Now, at this point, he's angry. He's not, uh, he's not in the forgiving mode himself, is he? Talking about Jeremiah. How long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed and the birds because they've said he shall not see our final end, our acharit. Verse 5. But if you've run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with the horses? And if in the time of peace, when you trusted, uh, they wearied you, then how will you do in the swelling of the Jordan? How many of you have heard that verse preached in various ways? In other words, if you're, not, if you're not able to keep up with godliness when everything's going well, how are you going to keep up with being a godly person when everything's difficult? That's the essence of what's being said there. You know. Um, that verse 4, um, the, the last part of the King James of verse 4 says, last end. Everybody see that? Or do you have something different like final end? You have final end. The Hebrew word is acharit, and it means something different than final end. It means at the end of time. 
And so the Lord sees the, you know, the, the scripture says the Lord sees the end from the beginning. It's the acharit. From, from right now, you make a decision. The Lord sees the implications of that decision to the end of time. Every life it affects, everything. In other words, I make a decision here. Um, this is hypothetical. I make a decision here. I'm going to go to a bar and get drunk, okay? The Lord sees where that leads. I go to a bar and get drunk. You know, I get... Um, I meet a woman, I have an affair, I, my family breaks up, my kids are lost, you know, their families are broken up, on and on, their grandchildren are broken, their families, their lives are ruined, on and on and on, until Jesus comes back. That's the Acharit. That's the way the Lord sees things. He sees the final end immediately. All we see is the here and now, you know. And so the Lord is seeing these things prophetically that we would live our lives very differently. If every decision we made, we saw the final end from the day the decision was made. Agreed? You know, a lot of people that make very bad decisions would, uh, would refrain from those decisions if they saw where they led. And the Lord does see them. Verse uh, 7, I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Uh, verse 10, many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. The vineyard is Israel. Uh, they have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. This is talking about religious leaders and civil leaders in Israel's case. Verse 14, thus says the Lord against all my evil neighbors that touch the inheritance with which I've caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I'll pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. And it shall come to pass after that I've plucked them out. I'll return and have compassion on them. We'll bring them again, every man to his heritage and every man to his land. It shall come to pass that they will diligently learn the ways of my people. To swear by my name, the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal. So the nations are going to learn righteousness ultimately through this unrighteous backslidden people. The Lord's going to call them back to a place of righteousness and then, um, as Isaiah prophesied, the law will go forth from Zion and so forth. So I want to stop uh, there tonight because um, uh, we go into in chapter 13. There's a prophetic act that I want to expound on. And then the whole prophetic act of chapter 18, the potter's house. And then chapter 19, the related bottle, the pottery bottle. There's a number of prophetic acts we'll get into next week. Does everybody know what a prophetic act is? A prophetic act is when the Lord directs something to be done in the natural that represents something in the spirit. So next week we'll have three major examples of that, you know, that take place. But let's stop um, for, for now. We'll stop there. So I'm, stop, I'm making a note. We're stopping on 12, chapter 12, and Josh will pick up on 13 next week. You're my reminder because Peter's not here, but I'll make a note. Everybody good with that? So read um, 13 through, uh, let's go 13 through 23 for next week. And we'll stop. And everybody, thank God this week that you're not um, the recipient of a ministry like Jeremiah. Because he had a tough one. Lord, we thank you for Jeremiah. We thank you that he was faithful in his generation to proclaim the word of the Lord that you gave him. And uh, Lord, whether it's easy or hard, I pray that we would be faithful to proclaim your words that you give us. And Lord, as you said to Jeremiah, that your word in his mouth was like fire. May your word in our mouths be like your word in your mouth. Lord, when we, um, when we speak your words, Lord, uh, we, claim, we just claim that you would... Do what you said, Lord, that your word would not return to you without having accomplished what you desire. So, Lord, um, the word is going out from this place tonight, from all of our, our hearts and our lives this week. Let it not return. Let the word not return without having accomplished what you want. We surrender it to you. We submit it to you. And we count on you and your covenant faithfulness, Lord, to finish what you started. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody would like prayer, I'd be happy to pray with you afterwards.